Joining me today is someone that many of you will be familiar with. He's a man ahead of his time. He has seen many things unfold in the world, and he made accurate predictions before they occurred. He is still open to surprises, though, especially the folly of mankind. He has gifted many with his vision, setting up a marketplace called the Agora, where experts can come and offer their insights and solutions to those who are interested in hearing it. In fact, Fatal Investment Research is a subsidiary of the Agora Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Bill Bonner. I understand that you founded Agora in 1979 aimed at filling a major hole in the mainstream financial media and the advising industry to empower and inform readers rather than tell them what to think. In the many decades that Agora has operated, the world has gone through many changes. Now, in the recent three years, we have seen the world turn upside down. What makes you believe that Agora is still as relevant and important as it was when you first founded it? Uh, well, I think it's actually much more relevant. You know, back back in the 70s, when we started, the world was in uh, America anyway, and I don't know about the rest of the world, but it was in the uh, grip of a, an inflationary cycle. Hmm. And uh, what and the, the mainstream media and Wall Street, the mainstream financial services were totally ill equipped to deal with it. They didn't understand it. Mm. They were still preaching the same old story, which was, you know, buy stocks and you'll be fine. But stocks during the 1970s went down. You didn't people didn't notice it because in in nominal terms, prices stayed about the same. But after inflation, they were, had people investors had lost about half their money. Anyway, the the popular press and the mainstream financial services had no real explanation or understanding or ways to cope with this. And that was when the our, our industry, the newsletter industry, got started because we offered an alternative. Mm. And we then started to say, wait a minute, this is not right. This inflation is here to, you know, unless somebody does something, it's going to stay here. It's going to get worse. The dollar is going to be devalued and devalued mm. more. And the solution to that back then, we said, was you got you just got to go back to real money. You got to buy gold. <laughs> and that Advice proved very, very correct. Mm. But then, of course, everything changed when uh, Paul Volcker came in and stopped the process. He stopped the inflationary cycle and then it changed everything. And then then we went through a long period of confusion, sort of confusion, at least from our standpoint, because there was the mainstream pitch which was is always, by the way, to buy investments because the mainstream media is supported by Wall Street advertising and so mm. on. It's, it, it's, it's rather incestuous. But what happens is then the average person comes to believe that the thing to do is to buy stocks. And mm. uh, he believes that the, the Wall Street is there to help him make money. Mm. And this is of course not true at all. The Wall Street is there to help itself make money. It doesn't really care about him. But anyway, so during this period of uh, the inflationary cycle began again almost immediately after Paul Volcker had stopped it. But it was invisible. It was invisible, I think, largely because China came along and was exporting huge amounts of stuff at mm. very, very low prices. And that kind of a disguised the whole phenomenon. But we went through this long period of more and more real inflation, which is to say the, the Fed introducing more money and more credit into society, but it not being clear at all what it meant. And it's only in the last year, in the last year or so, that it's becoming obvious that this did not work. It was not a good idea. And all the things that we've been warning against all these years, that you can't introduce more and more money without paying a price sometime, that that time has come. And now, again, the mainstream media is totally at a loss. You know, they, they're pitching the latest downturn as a temporary thing, and they're saying it's time to buy the dip, time to get back in, the, the bottom is in, all the things they typically say. And I don't think it's true. 
Hmm. I think that what's happened is we turned a major corner where the Fed is now in that very, very familiar trap, hmm. inflate or die. It has to either return to inflating, which is what will happen if it cuts rates again or begins, goes back to its quantitative uh, e easing process, hmm. or it's got to stick with raising rates. And if it sticks with raising rates, that means that that economy, those investments, those stocks that are so highly priced, all that stuff has to go down. It has to go down because the cost of sustaining it as interest rates rise, it gets higher and higher. And that's the mess. That's our message. And that's not the message of the mainstream media at all. So that's why I believe that our message is, once again, extremely valuable for individual investors. Hmm. Actually, it's interesting because uh, I almost feel that mainstream media, they tell you what's happening now. Uh, and then six to 12 months later, you realize that uh, they're wrong and they've literally been, uh, they've got a perfect track record in this sense. And we're trying to um, deconstruct that and get our readers to to think ahead. And we may be wrong immediately, but uh, we could well be um, getting them at the right place now. Now, this, this leads me to the next question, which is, um, you know how Agora's been around for almost as long as a petrodollar system, which our okay. analysts have been uh, tracking. So the petro petrodollar system is boomed, it's peaked, it's losing steam. And one of the most robust line of service we provide in our advice is on gold investments. But we have seen while the financial system is on its last legs, Many financial pundits offer different solutions and they always ignore gold or they always downplay gold. Now, what are your views of this? Like, Think, think about, for example, Warren Buffett, who says that uh, gold does nothing but look at you. And there's also plenty of mainstream commentators who say gold is outdated, serves no purpose. What, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, as far as I know, uh, gold is just like it's always been. And I think in some sense, Buffett is right. Hmm. And, uh, and I'm hesitant to use the word. You got to be very cautious about how you describe it. Because if you say I'm investing in gold, you know, what does that mean? Because gold is, doesn't produce anything. It doesn't add value in any way. As Buffett says, it just looks at you. <laughs> well, sometimes you know, sometimes that's just what you wanted to do and nothing more. I just mm. wanted to look at me and have that same smile on its face year after year. That's all mm. I want from gold. I don't want it to go up. I don't want it to go down. I don't want it to go away. Mm. And that's what gold does. You know, they dug up uh, a uh, they they were digging around in England and they found this uh, this 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 cache of uh, old gold coins and things from mm. like 700 it was from a Saxon raid in the year 700. Well, hmm. those coins uh, the, in the gold value of those coins is about the same today as it was hmm. back then. You know, the hmm. numismatic or the historic value is much higher, but the actual gold value is about the same. And that's hmm. true just about any gold. You know, it just doesn't go away. And uh, so you have to you have to make that distinction. What do you want from gold? If you want your money not to go away, as far as we know, gold is the best way to do that. You know, you can try to buy some crypto coins, you can buy some land, you can buy art. And a lot of it, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't work. But as far as we know, gold is the most reliable thing that doesn't go away. And then as far as investing goes, well, you can invest in a gold mining company. Hmm. And maybe you'll make money, but then you have to do a lot of analysis about it because it's a company and and you make money in so far as the company itself is profitable. That's an investment. But hmm. uh, but, it's, but what we're concerned about now right now is uh, is protecting. Hmm. We, we think we're in a downturn. We think we're in a crisis period. We think we're in a period of confusion and chaos in the financial markets. And in a period like that. You want, unless you're very smart or very fast, you know, or unless you've got a very long term horizon, you know, you might mm. you might buy stocks now thinking your grandchildren will, will will benefit from them in the future. But if you just want to hold on to your retirement money, gold is probably the safest, surest, most proven way to do it. No guarantees, of course, but that's mm. that historically, that's what the way it works. It just looks at you and it and, and, and that's all you want. 
So it's not an investment, but it is a way to hold on to what you've got. That's interesting because, uh, like, we have people who go, who who feel that because it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything, and we live in a fast-moving world. Um, like, ima- ima- imagine, Bill. Like, imagine technology not going anywhere. Um, that we we want development, so that's why they they put gold behind us. So you have you have the electronic payment system that's uh, sprung up, and now you've got the digital blockchain, and uh, I'm sure you've heard this many times where people say, look, we've got this, we've got your electronic payments, we've got the blockchain. Why do we need gold? It's gold's tr- well and truly finished. But you've been around for a long time. You, you've, seen, you've seen fads and you've seen things that last. Do you think that gold is, is, it, is it finished or is there a future for it? Well, I mean, if... if- if humans and human technology were infallible, <laughs> we wouldn't need gold. Hmm. But humans, bless their hearts, they make mistakes and they tend to get carried away. And they get carried away every minute bit as much today as they did during the tulip bubble. You know, they hmm. they they just look at the cryptocurrencies. You know, you know the blockchain may make sense. It may hmm. be useful. Bitcoin may be a useful way to trade money. I know I spent a lot of time in Argentina and Bitcoin is a useful way to get money because people don't trust the peso. They don't trust the banks. They don't trust the government and they do trust the black market <laughs> <laughs> and they do trust Bitcoin because it delivers. Hmm. And by, by the way, in, in Argentina, it delivers to your door. You, oh, you wow. send your money to these things they call the caves. You send hmm. Bitcoin to the caves and some guy will come to your door with a paper bag full of cash, <laughs> full of uh, pesos. Whether that's a good trade or not, I don't know. But hmm. the point is that Bitcoin does work hmm. in certain circumstances and, thing, and things can be useful and progress is made. Technology does throw up advances. But there are times when you don't know whether the next cryptocurrency is going to fail. And we've seen just in the last few weeks, we've seen these colossal failures in the crypto space hmm. and uh and and you know what's under the hood of those things you just don't know gold you know you know you, it, hmm. you know what's there it's it's what it it says it is it's what it looks like it is it's nothing more than that it's not going up it's not going down it's not going away and that's all hmm. that you want from it so is that a useful thing well i think as long as you have doubts about the solidity the sensibility the the intellectual capacity and the honesty of your fellow man, <laughs> then gold <laughs> is a useful thing to have. Yeah. And um, I guess that's, yeah, you, when, when something goes wrong, you want, you want to go back to what you feel safe, uh, safe with. And I mean, this, this comes to um, mankind being able to make calls uh, about where it's heading. Um, I mean, man, mankind in general, it's hard for them to predict, but individuals uh, are able to um, make calls, uh, take a bet on it and see whether they get it right or not. Now, I believe that you have made uh, quite a number of uh, big calls that turned out to be right uh, in terms of identifying key trends in each decade. So casting your memory back uh, apparently back in 2000, uh, you actually called for the next decade to be the gold dollar trade where gold would go up, dollar would go down. And then in 2010, you expected that it would be the Japan bond trade where Japanese stocks go up and bonds go down. Now I'm going to um, hold your feet to the fire a little bit. Uh, Hopefully we won't quote you on this, but um, you're calling for this decade to be long energy. Now, where would gold be in your view? And um, what would the long-term trade for gold workout. Oh well, well, well I mean, re- remember that uh, these are trades. <laughs> it's guesswork. It's mm. guesswork because it's partly an intellectual exercise rather than an investment. You know, we're trying to figure out how these pieces fit together. Mm. And in the case of the Japan thing, I don't know anything about Japan. <laughs> mm. I just read the newspaper, and I could see that Japan equities stocks have been going down for a long time, decades. Whereas Japan bonds have been going up for a long time. And I figure there's no way that's going to continue. As it turned out, I was mostly right, but not totally right. I mean, the bonds went up more than you thought for longer than we expected. 
Hmm. But so, so looking at the same thing now as in the case of a, an intellectual exercise, we see practically all the world's governments, not all the world's governments, but the Western governments, particularly, you know, coming out trying to stop the use of fossil fuel. Hmm. And we see fewer and fewer oil wells being drilled. You know, who wants to build a refinery? You know, to build a refinery, you have to commit money today for something that you won't get any money back from for hmm. years and years. And then who knows by then you know, the government will have made it illegal to use uh, fossil fuel. <laughs> so the refineries aren't being built. The wells aren't being drilled. The, hmm. the pipelines aren't being made. And so what this means is that the existing sources of, of fuel the existing companies, the existing assets, the companies that make it now and are pumping it, those are going to be more valuable simply because they will have no competition. Hmm. They're the only sources of this of this fuel. So as an intellectual exercise, it seems likely to me that over the next 10 years, as this whole agenda develops and hmm. bears its fruit, whatever it is, that we will see an increase in the value, the relative value of energy producers over the U.S. dollar. That seems to me, that's the intellectual part of it. Now, mm -hmm. the gold part of it, where does gold fit in? Gold fits in where it always does, as a hedge against being wrong. You know, if I thought that I was infallible, if I thought that I was 100% sure that I'm right, I never am, if I were... I would forget about gold. I don't need gold. Gold is a protection against being wrong. Hmm. And gold, in this case, you know, I'd say I will. I'm not going to put all of my money into this trade, which is intellectually interesting, intellectually fascinating, and I think probably right. But hmm. who knows? You know, things happen that you, you know, beyond the mind and imagination of mankind, things happen, and so. Uh, so, th I mean, that's how the pieces fit together. As a trade, I like the trade, trading mm. long energy, short dollar. I like that trade. As a way to protect my family's wealth for generations to come, I like gold. So I'll, I'll have some combination of them. And I think that's the prudent thing for people to do, to bet on what they think is right, but to hedge with gold just in case they're not. How well has gold actually worked for you, gold related investments um, in relation to the other um, assets that you also own, if uh, you're at liberty to tell us um, how you invest? Well, there's nothing uh, uh, unusual or particularly interesting about the way I invest. I, as I say, I use gold just as protection, not as an investment. Mm. And uh, when I don't know what to do with money, I put it into gold just to keep it there until I figure out what to do. Uh, it's, you know, in, in, in my life, I've invested heavily in business because you know, like Warren Buffett, I think that's the way you, you make money, but mm. you only have so much range, so much bandwidth of your own time and energy and your own intelligence, really. I mean, you can't learn many businesses. You can, you're lucky you'll learn one or two of them in your lifetime. And then you apply your brain to it and your capital and you try to make more. And often you find that that the more you know about it, the, re the more you realize that you can't make any money in it, that it's too difficult, it takes too much time or something rather. So anyway, you end up falling back on gold as a mm. place to hold, what, which is what it's always meant to be, mm. and what money itself is always meant to be, which is a store of value. In gold, what you're doing is you're saving. I'm saving, for example, you know, 30 years ago, I had an idea and I published a book and made some money and I'm saving that money in gold. That effort mm. that I put in 30 years ago now is present in various lumps of yellow metal. And mm. those lumps of yellow metal will outlast me. I mean, that's what it's all. That's what it's designed to do. But remember, that is not an investment. It's just a way of preserving other investments. So that, that's the role that gold plays for me. If I were smarter, you know, I would look into it more deeply and I would look into the gold mining part of it and I would figure out just how to get some leverage on it. Mm. I think we're in a bull market, beginning a bull market in gold. So what happens is you get more leverage by owning not just gold, but the companies that produce it, that explore for it and so on. And that's a whole different thing. 
And as I say, if I if I knew more about that, that's what I would do. I don't believe it's a good idea to get too heavily in currencies. Cause, I mean, get to spend a lot of time on currency because they are so unpredictable. And uh, I don't know. I've never figured out how it how it works. I mean, they, they raised rates in the U.S. Investors are looking for safety. They go to the, the dollar. The dollar goes up. That triggers all sorts of horrible things all over the world because they Emerging markets where they owe a lot of dollars have a hard time paying. And that's especially true in Argentina, which we keep track of because my one of my partners lives in Buenos Aires. So uh, it, it's, it, it's an interesting phenomenon, but I, unpredict, from, from my standpoint of view, unpredictable. Yeah, especially when uh, we've got so many central banks. Um, are they, do you feel that they're coordinating the rate rises or do you think that they're all kind of like... Uh, hurting cats I, I don't think they coordinate exactly but they certainly talk I mean mm. they they have they, they court in some sense they must coordinate because uh, mm. they all do the same thing but they don't all do it at the same time mm. and now uh, now the European Central Bank is on board with a small rate cut too so uh, where that leads I don't know do you think that we could head into a depression before the um Federal Reserve and the other central banks um, pause interest rates, uh, re- the interest yeah. rate hike, or do you think that? Well, that's kind going of what I would. Ex- no, that's kind of what I would expect. You know, they're hmm. they're on course and they'll continue. I assume until something terrible happens, <laughs> and then, then they'll stop. And uh, I presume that's going to be something terrible and terrible schmerable. I mean, it doesn't, it's really what has to happen. They've got to continue raising rates as long as inflation is, is, uh, is high. And mm. as they do it, they put more and more pressure on borrowers. And since in the U S there's uh, something like three, like uh, $90 trillion for the debt, it means there's a lot of people, a lot of businesses that can't sustain higher interest rates. So you're going to see some fallout from that. I think. If it, if it doesn't happen like that, I will be surprised. Yeah, because I am noticing quite a number of small businesses shut down and there are, there are just so many um, abandoned uh, shop fronts and all that. Uh, what's it like in Baltimore? Uh, well, Baltimore is a special case because it's a city that is uh, particularly bad, badly run. Every, mm. The businesses have moved out. People have moved out. It's a... It is a disaster. It's a zombie town, really. You think the election, the midterm election, uh, would see a replacement of um, the current corruption in Maryland, or do you think that uh, it's probably going to well, continue? I, I really don't follow it, uh, uh-huh. I, and I, it's, to me, it's unbelievable. I mean, the city lives on corruption, and I assume that that will continue. Corruption, and not just corruption, but incompetence. You know, yeah. it, it benefits from incompetence. It, uh, you know, it spreads a lot of money around in a lot of places that should never, never get any money and everybody's happy with it. And I don't think that's going to change. I think in general, by the way, yeah. I think the whole West, all the, the West, Western society is headed yeah. for this kind of crisis of, of incompetence where yeah. the, the people who run it, the, uh, the elites, uh, practically yeah. all countries, the elites are are becoming more and more congealed at the top, more and more fixed in their dopey ways. You know, this trip, but you all are probably more sensitive to this than I am. But this uh, man, Pelosi going to Taiwan, you know, this, you know, what in the world is she thinking? You know, there are all these dumb things that keep happening and dumb, dumb ways of spending money and more and more waste, more and more controls, more and more regulation. More, especially in the, in the whole green agenda, is there is hmm. a built in just a whole lot of a uh, lot of waste. And as that happens, it means that the real society, the real economy of goods and services, gets gets squeezed harder and harder. And the average household gets squeezed harder and harder. And eventually, the thing blows up. But I don't know how or when. You you've seen the um, Western society kind of uh, reach the brink back in uh, the oil crisis and all that, and also Paul Volcker. Now, do you see that there is a breaking point at which um, the people actually just stand up and say, screw you all uh, up, up the top, and uh, the, the elites realize that they have to either walk back or they get replaced? Um, or, or do you feel that it's just this perpetual 
of decay. No, I, I, what I see is the kind of uh, increasing uh, corruption and uh, cynicism. Mm. And I see this mainly from my, our experience in uh, Argentina. Argentina has had been going this way for 70 years, and uh, there's no sign of it really changing. You know, people, it's just that it shows you that democracy has a has a limit. And mm. the, it just, at a certain point, it be, just becomes very, it's just impossible to react. You know, people think they're voting for something. They're never voting for anything. You know, what's happening is happening apart from anything they want, anything they think about. Mm. And there's no way the system does not correct itself. It just gets worse and worse. Now, what, uh, uh, interestingly, in Argentina, Argentina is a rich country, mm. and uh, it's gotten poorer over the last seven decades. <laughs> and but it never seems to get to the point where uh, it really changes. You know, and there, you know, there are riots in the streets. There mm. are, right now there are people, there are people who, who survive by picking through mm. trash heaps. And, and, and Argentina was once the seventh richest country in the world. But, it was the richest along with Australia at the turn of the 20th century, to my understanding. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And uh, But now you know, there's no connection between Australia and Argentina, <laughs> they're, except they're both in the Southern Hemisphere. They're very, very different places. So anyway, I don't know. You see, I think it was Keynes who said there is a lot of, what does he say? There's a lot, a lot of ruin hmm. in, in, in a society. And Argentina shows how much ruin there is. And there's certainly a whole lot of ruin in the whole West. And I feel it's probably going to, we're going to probably see a lot of it over the next few decades. Not something that I'll be looking forward to. Uh, <laughs> no, no, there's not still quite a number of years ahead, but, ahead of me. And also, but that said, <laughs> yeah, but that said, you can still have an excellent stake in Argentina. That, oh, well, that's that's always... And you can still live well, too, just that most people don't. <laughs> Excellent. And what types of things do you do with yourself uh, nowadays to uh, pass your time? <laughs> I'm fully fully occupied both in in business and in pleasure. And uh, I am a, I'm a, I, on the weekends, I'm a amateur builder. Mm. And I've been doing this all my life, been building with... Uh, with stone, with adobe, with wood, <laughs> I enjoy it quite a bit. But there's no, it, there's no uh, profit in it. It's just pure amusement. How else can readers find out more about uh, your work and the way you think? Oh well, just look up uh, Bonner Private Research, and that's where we pu we publish on uh, Substack. Mm. It's kind of odd because it's outside of our own business, but it's a different kind of thing. And it's more, more, almost more of a hobby than a business. We have a publishing business. We've been publishing newsletters, as you pointed out, you know, for the last 40 years. Hmm. But this is not that. It's not really a business. It's more like something we wanted to do with. A, I do it with uh, Tom Dyson and Dan Denning, who have have been at it for a long time, too. And uh, we're enjoying it, and we think we're providing a good service, but it's not exactly commercial. Bill, it's an inspiration to have you with us, and I'm sure that uh, there's many insights that you shared today that uh, we can all take away and become better people like uh, yourself. <laughs> and uh, many thanks, and God bless, Bill. Well, thank you, Brian. It's been a pleasure. How do you enjoy that? Bill is a man full of vision and inspiration. Despite his many successes, he's very down to earth. One of the many takeaways I had with Bill's view is that he sees gold as insurance and protection from major disasters and human error. I share that view too. I believe gold gives you peace of mind as you hold on to it. As it had been, it is and will be. It's indeed a privilege for us to chat with Bill, and I hope you got a lot out of it as I had. See you soon.